good morning. Let's get started. So we were talking about uh, refraction last time. Uh, refraction is bending of light when the light goes from one medium to another medium, for example from air to glass. And the bending of light is due to changing the speed. Whenever light goes from one medium to another medium, there is change in speed of light because of which light bends. Okay. And we saw the rules that govern the bending of light. The first rule is when the light goes from less dense medium to denser medium, okay, air to glass, light bends towards the normal. So I showed you last time. You don't remember. So let's say we have air and glass. So air is less dense medium, glass is denser medium, and light traveling in air hits the glass. So that's the light ray. And we usually draw a normal with a draft dashed line. In this case, I will draw a solid line. So that's the normal. And we measure the angle with respect to the normal. Okay, so this is the angle of incidence. Uh, sometimes we call it I, sometimes theta I, sometimes just uh, theta 1. Okay, let's call it theta 1. Okay, angle of incidence. And let me. Um, draw this normal all the way down, so that's the normal. And then the first rule is if the light going is going from less dense to denser medium, it bends towards the normal. Instead of going straight like that, it bends towards the normal like this. Okay, that's the first rule. This is a refracted ray or bent ray. This is incident rate. And the refractive index of air is, let's call it N1. If you don't remember, refractive index is ratio of speed of light in air or vacuum over speed of light in a medium. Okay, so this is the refractive index of, in this case, let's say it's glass. Ng is the refractive index of glass. Then it would be speed of light in air, it could also be vacuum because they have almost same speed and over speed of light in glass, okay? this V is speed in the glass. Let's, like, like that, if I want to write refractive index of water, then it would be speed of light in vacuum over speed of light in water. Okay? So this V is speed of light in water, it's the ratio of two speeds of light, light. So this is angle of refraction. We call this theta r or sometimes r or just theta 2. Okay, so this is the first rule. And the second rule is if the light is going from denser to less dense medium, from glass to air, okay, if the light hits the boundary between glass and air, That's the incident light, and that's the incident angle in this case. Then light bends away from the normal. So if there were no different media, media, if the media were both same, both glass glass or air air, it would just go straight. Okay, in absence of different medium, it would go straight. But because of the change in medium, in this case, it goes away from the normal. It travels like that. Okay? So instead of going straight like that, it's bending away from the normal. In this case, instead of going straight like that, it's bending towards the normal. And then we also talked about Snell's law. Snell's law is, um, in this case, the refractive index of one medium 
Okay, so that's the refractive index times sine of angle in that medium, theta one, is equal to refractive index in the second medium, n two, and the refractive index in that medium, which is sorry, refractive index in that medium times sine of angle in that medium, theta two. Okay, so that's the Snell's law. And this is true for both the cases, whether it's moving from less dense to denser or from denser to less dense, true. Okay, so in this case also, if you write this N1, then it will be N1 sine theta 1. If you write this N2, that will be N2 So in this case, this would be the angle. And then angle is always measured with respect to the normal. That's something you need to keep in mind. So M2 sine theta 2. Snell's law. So, so here I have a class, a class. glass. If I hit this glass with light, <coughs> so <coughs> in absence of different medium, it just travels straight. So light travels straight, but if I introduce this different medium, then light bends. Okay? You see here, light, light, light bends. So instead of going straight like that, it bends. Now, look at the light inside the glass okay, and that glass. So this is the refracted ray and that, that's the incident ray. The light inside the glass is incident ray. Okay. So as I increase the angle of as I increase the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction also increases. Okay. As I increase the angle of incidence, I'm increasing the angle of incidence angle of refraction also increases. So that's the angle of refraction. I mean, this is the refract. You draw a line here normal. So that's the surface, and that's the normal. OK, you see that. So the angle formed by that, is, uh, that refracted ray with this normal is the angle of refraction. And as, as I increase the angle of incidence, you see the angle of refraction is also increasing. The angle of refraction is increasing. Now at some point, at some angle of incidence, the angle of refraction would be 90 degrees. Okay, so you see here, as I increase, 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 so right now it's about 90 degrees. And if I increase further than that, instead of going into Different medium, it will just go, come back in the same medium. So now, it's not going into the air anymore. It's it's returning back in the. You need to see inside the glass. Okay, so inside the glass, now instead of refraction, there is reflection. Okay, so light returns back in the same medium. So here, light goes in air. That's the refraction. Okay, as I increase the angle of incidence. At some point, it would be 90 degrees. And then if I increase further than that, the light would be reflected back in the same medium, in glass. Okay? That's total internal reflection. So there is an important term here, which is called critical angle. So 
here is my incident ray, and here is my refracted ray. So this is refracted ray, and that's my incident ray. And this case is only true for, so the thing, thing that we are going to talk here is true only for when light is going from denser to less dense. Okay? We are going to talk about a particular, a special kind of uh, case, which is true for this one only. So this is angle of incidence with respect to the normal, you know, one. And that's the angle of refraction with respect to normal. And I, I said, like I said before, if I increase this, so when I increase this angle, when I increase that angle, this angle also increases. Okay? So that angle also increases. That's theta 1, that's theta 2. As I increase it furthermore, at some point, so as I increase this furthermore, So now that's the new angle, let's still call it theta. Now this would, at this particular angle, this angle of refraction would move, or this uh, refracted ray would move through the surface of this uh, medium. Okay, it would move through the surface. In this case, this angle is 90 degrees. So this theta one, which is angle of incidence, so the angle of incidence which is theta one here, for which the angle of refraction Theta 2 is 90 degrees, it is called the critical angle. Now, this angle, theta 1, is called critical angle, and it's denoted by theta sub c. And if you further increase the angle, let's say if I increase more than theta c, what do you think will happen? If I increase it more than theta c, So this angle is now greater than theta c. So what will happen to the refracted ray? It will reflect. Yeah, it will, instead of going into a second medium, it will go back in the same medium. It will return back in the same medium. Now in this case, because it's reflected, that means it follows the laws of reflection. The laws of reflection is the angle of incidence, incidence must be equal to the angle of reflection. So it's now following the law of reflection where this angle, let's call this theta, uh, we should give a different name here, theta 2 prime. Okay? So this theta 2 prime would be equal to theta 1 because it's, it's not 
refracted ray. This is now reflected ray. Okay. And this phenomenon is called total internal reflection. Okay. So when theta 2 is greater than theta c, the light is reflected in the same medium. And that's called TIR, total internal reflection. important phenomena because this is applied in many many real life um, applications. For example, um, in hospitals, doctors use endoscope. Endoscope is based on TIR, total internal reflection. Um, nowadays, we use optical cable instead of those wire cable to um, get the um, internet connection. So that's also based on TIR. So So in order to get the total internal reflection, I need to hit the medium at the angle greater than critical angle. So the angle needs to be greater than critical angle. So for example, in this case, it's hard to see here. But if you see here, if I hit this medium by light, the light undergoes total internal reflection inside the glass, and it comes out from this end. Okay? So what happens is you have this medium. Okay, so you hit the medium with light at some angle that is greater than critical angle. So this angle is this angle is greater than critical angle. So instead of going outside, with, instead of refracting the light outside, it returns in the same medium. Okay. That's total internal reflection. And then this light ray is again reflected back in the same medium instead of refracting outside. So it's again reflected back, reflected back, reflected back, and your eyes see that. Or if it is um, optical cable, you send the signal in form of light. So they have this conversion thing. So they feed the electrical signal to that box. Okay. And then that electrical signal is converted to light. And then that light is fed into optical cable. And then that optical cable is what you get in your internet. Okay. Um, it's much, much better. This optical cable is much, much better than the wire cable because there is very little uh, loss of signal. In case of wire cable, you have about 30 to 40% loss of signal. But in optical cable, it's very efficient. Okay. Um, so there are lots of applications of TIR. The reason diamond is um, expensive is because of this phenomenon, TIR. So what happens inside of diamond is, so you have this shape of diamond. 
the light enters the diamond, here like that, at some angle. So instead of going out, it gets reflected, and then there is multiple reflection inside the diamond, multiple reflection. And then the light enters the diamond, and there is again in total internal reflection. And there are many, uh, many, many uh, internal reflections inside the diamond. And finally, when the light comes out, all the light comes out, come out at the one at the same time. Okay, giving very uh, brilliant uh, kind of light. Okay, so it's very, very. Um, peculiar of diamond. Usually you don't see that in ordinary glass. So let's see. I can show you an example here. So let's look at the problem. So using this uh, phenomena, we can um, find a refractive index of diamond. Okay? So let's say the refractive index of diamond is n. Okay? So what is the refractive index of diamond? Let's say, or even a glass, let's say, a glass. So we can find the refractive index of either glass or diamond or water. Whatever. So let's look at the problem. So light incident So light incidence at diamond ear interface at angle What is the refractive index of diamond? So when you hit the diamond at 24 degrees, it undergoes TIR. So what is the refractive index of diamond? So we are talking about this interface where hit the surface at 24 degrees and it goes sort of internal reflection. So how do we find N of diamond? Snail law. Yeah, exactly. Snail's law. Use snail's law. So let's say this is N1 or um, let's call this N air. N air is 1. Okay, here actually at 24 degrees Celsius. It, this is the critical angle. Okay, it just undergoes the TIR. Okay.
So at 24 degrees Celsius, it starts to undergo TIR. Okay? So that's the threshold angle. That's why it's called critical angle. That's why you do this. And any angle greater than that undergoes the TIR. Okay? So NG or ND is what we need to find. So we have Snell's law N1 uh, sine theta 1 N2 sine theta 2. So N1 in this case is ND sine theta 1 is 24 degrees and N2 is 1 which is the refractive index of air and sine that's 90 degrees. So ND sine 24 degrees, that's 1. So sine 90 degrees is 1. So ND is 1 over sine 24 degrees. Uh, I don't have calculator with me, but if you calculate that, it should come out to be, uh, let's see, what? it's 2.3, it's about 2.3. So that's the refractive index of diamond. Let's see another question here. So what is the critical angle of glass that has We have the refractive index of 1.5. What is its critical angle? Critical angle is again angle at which theta r is 90 degrees. Okay? Angle of refraction is 90 degrees. And we can find theta corresponding to that. So use the Snell's law. We have again this TIR is only it occurs only when light goes from denser to less dense medium. So in this case, assume that the light is going from glass to air. So we need to find this theta C critical angle and theta r is 90 degrees. So we want to find that. So given ng is 1.5 and na is, you need to know na. If it is not given, then you need to assume that it's 1. So um, Snell's law, we apply Snell's law here, ng times sine of that angle, theta c, is equal to n a and sine of that angle, sine 90 degrees. So ng is 1.5 sine theta c, n a is 1, sine 90 is also 1. So sine theta c is 1 over 1.5, so theta c is sine inverse of 1 over 1.5. Okay. Um, so we'll calculate that and we get the critical angle. So what is the angle? 41.8. 41.8. So any angle greater than theta c will give the total internal reflection. If you hit the glass air interface at any angle that is greater than anything that is greater than 41.8 will result in TIR. Okay? Anything less than that will give the refraction. 
if your angle is less than, so this, if this is uh, less than 41.8, then it will go in the second medium. But if it is greater than 41.8, then it goes TIR. Now you compare the, t, uh, the critical angle for diamond and water. So water, not water, glass. So glass has 41.8 and diamond has 24. So in diamond, when light hits above 24 degrees, then it goes TIR. So to, this is very small angle to go to TIR. So even with like very small angle, it can go TIR. That's why diamond is is different from other um, material because its its critical angle is very low. At very small angle, light can go TIR. Whereas in glass, you need 41 degrees or um, 41.8 and greater to go to TIR. So what are other applications of refraction? One of the very important applications of refraction is uh, lenses. So lenses in many different real life applications like glasses, camera, telescopes, microscopes and all those applications use lenses and the lenses work on the basis of refraction. Okay, So there are two types of lenses to basic types of lenses. They are convex and concave. They have two basic types of lenses. That's the that's called <coughs> concave lens. Okay? It's also called diverging lens. And this is convex lens, converging lens. So what it does is it, it um, converge the parallel rays, if you pass the parallel rays to it, it converges all the parallel rays into a single point. Okay. Let me show you how it converges the parallel rays. <coughs> so I have Parallel rays, you see there. Okay, so if I place this in the path of this parallel rays, then this will converge all these rays into a single point. See there? That's the single point. So that's why it's called converging lens. So convex lens is a converging lens. Okay, whereas this concave, this is concave, is diverging lens because it diverges the rays away from the focal point from from where it is coming from. So see here, it's diverging. It's not very clear here. You see the, these light rays. It's not exactly heating at the middle, that's why you don't see it very clearly. So you see these rays, they are diverged by this. This, these are diverging, whereas this one converges. So that's just opposite. Now, their main function is to form images, but how they form the images? That's what we are, we are going to talk now. So there are three rules that you need to remember. find out how they form the images.
So here's the converging lens. And all the parallel rays are converged at that point, and the distance between the center of the lens and that converging point. This distance is called focal length. Okay, so it's denoted by small letter f. So small letter f is the focal length. That's the distance between the lens, center of the lens, and the focal point. With the diverging lens, you see the rays are diverged, and these diverging these diverse rays are they appear to come from a, a, a fixed point here. They appear to come from this single point, and that point is called focal point in this in, in, in case of converging lens, or in case of uh, diverging lens. So, so if you produce these rays backward, they meet at a point. Okay, that's the focal point. And the distance between that point and the center of the lens is focal length. So that's the focal length. In this case, this is the focal length. Okay? So this distance is the focal length. So let's look at the three rules that we use to denote the image. So before we move on to the image formation, so let's look at this question. So which of these red diagrams is possibly correct? This one is not correct because this is converging lens. Converging lens does not diverge the rays. Instead of converging the rays, it's diverging, so that's not possible. Is this possible? Look at this ray. Instead of going straight, it's going that way. Is it converged or diverged? Converging means it's converging this way. Okay. Do you think this ray is converged or diverged? Diverged, right? So this is not possible. Converging means it would be going like that but it's diverged, so that's not possible. So this one is also diverged, that's not possible. That means this one. So this one is converged, that's also converged. And one rule here is, when the light goes through the center of the lens, it doesn't get bent, it just goes straight. Okay? So this is going to the center, so there's no problem with the that way, it can go straight. So the answer is D. Okay, so let's look at the rules to see how these uh, lenses form image. So here is an object, okay? and this is the focal length. Focal length is again the distance between the center of the lens and the point where all the parallel rays converge. If I send parallel rays, the parallel rays will be converged at that point. Okay? So that point is called focal, focal point, or it's also called focus. Distance between center and that focus is called focal length. And we can also write focal point on this side. So that's the distance f and I can draw distance f on this side and twice the distance f is called c okay? so this is small f, this distance is small f and twice that distance from the center is uh, called c or it's also written as r this is called center of curvature okay? focal point center of curvature focal point center of curvature So, distance between center of the meter to f is called focal length, and distance between center of the lens to c, center of curvature, is called radius of curvature. 
So um, radius of curvature r is 2 times f. So this distance is 2 times that distance. Okay, so the first rule is if a parallel ray from the object hits the lens, so there are millions of or trillions of rays that can originate from the object out of trillions of rays, let's, let's just consider one ray from the top of the object, okay? So from the top of the object, a ray travels parallel to this axis. Okay? So this is the optical axis, it's also called principal axis. So we consider one ray out of trillions, and that ray is traveling parallel to the axis. If we have a parallel ray, hitting the lens, then the ray will be refracted such a, in such a way that it goes through the focal point. Okay? That's the first, first rule. The so first rule is any ray that is parallel to the, this axis, principal axis, hitting the lens goes through the focal point. Second rule, if a ray goes to focal point, again there are again trillions of light rays we can have here, but we are considering only special cases here. Okay? So a light ray that goes to focal point hitting the lens will be refracted parallel to the axis, parallel to that axis. Second rule, okay? so light ray going to focal point is refracted parallel to the axis. Third one, if the light ray goes to the center of the lens, then it is not refracted. It just goes straight to the center. So using these three rules, we can see where the image is formed. So image is formed wherever these rays intersect. So this one is a refracted ray. That's refracted ray. That's refracted ray. Wherever these refracted rays intersect, that's the point where the image is formed. And if the intersection is below the axis, then the, ob then the image is inverted. If it is above the axis, it is upright. In this case, this is below the axis. So the image formed here is inverted. So I need to draw inverted image like that. And again, the base of the image would be on this axis. So that's the base, and that would be the tip of the object. Okay, so you see here, this object is formed beyond C. So when I place the object between C and F, the image is formed beyond F. That's the first characteristic characteristic of the image. Second characteristic here is look at the size. The size of this is bigger than that, okay? So the image is magnified. That's the second characteristic of the image. The third one is, it is inverted. Okay? And <clears throat> one very important thing here is, this image is formed by actual intersection of these rays. Okay, these are actual intersection of the rays. So whenever there is actual intersection of the rays, we can we can form the image on a piece of paper or a screen. If I put a piece of paper here or some kind of screen, then I would get the image projected on a piece of paper. Okay, and that kind of image is called real image. So this is a real image. Real image is formed by real intersection of the rays, and we can get the real image on a screen. Now let's look at a uh, diverging lens. So here is a diverging lens. Now we know that diverging lens does not converge. So if I hit the lens with a parallel ray, 
it won't converge the light, unlike the concave, uh, unlike the convex lens. So it's going to diverge the ray. It diverges the ray in such a way that the ray would appear to come from this point. Okay? So this would be diverged, but it's diverged in such a way that it appears to be coming from F. What that means is like that. So this is the actual diverse ray, but this appears to be coming from that point. That's the first rule. Second rule, if this ray hits the lens pointing towards F, so this ray is pointing towards F, and it hits at the lens. Okay, if the light hits at the lens pointing towards F, then it would be diverged parallel to the axis. So now this would be diverged. Diverged means again, instead of going straight like that, it would be diverged. Okay, it would go above that. So this would be diverged parallel to that axis. So diverged. <coughs> now the third one is it's the same as the previous one. If it goes to the center of the lens, then it won't get bent. It will just travel straight. Okay? That's the third rule. Now, in order to form image on a piece of paper, if I put a piece of paper here, the image would be formed only if these diffracted rays intersect. But these, these are diverging from each other. If I draw these rays far away here, they are diverging more and more. Okay? So they are diverging. So they will never meet on this part. That means you cannot get an image on a piece of paper or a screen. Okay? So what you need to do to get the image is you need to produce these rays backward. So you produce this one backward, and then this one also backward, this refracted ray. So we have this refracted ray. You produce it backwards. Okay. You produce this backward, like that. And produce this one also backward. So we have three refracted rays. This one, this one, and this one. They all produce backward. If I do that, they will meet at a point. So in this case, they will meet at this point, okay? here. So if I produce it back, it's that. Produce this one back, that. Put it back, that, so it, they meet at that point, and that's the point where the image is formed. So that's the point where the image is formed. And it's not due to the actual intersection of the rays. It's, it's due, to the, due to those like um, backward produced rays. So whenever you form, uh, form an image, by backward producing the rays, it's called virtual image, not real image. So this is the virtual image. And it's upright because the intersection is above the axis. Whenever the intersection is above the axis, it's upright. If it is below, then it's inverted. So the properties of image here is the image is virtual, not due to the real intersection. That's the first one. Second one is uh, it's upright because it's above the axis. It's smaller than the object. You can call it diminished. Okay. And it's formed not behind the lens. In the previous case, it was formed behind the lens, somewhere here. But in this case, it's formed in front of the lens. So this has very important consequence of its, in its application. We'll talk about that next time. I think we are out of time, so I'll stop at this point. And we'll continue this next time.